some introduction for me. I'm just a software engineer. I've been a software engineer for 10 years. I learned computing uh, by getting Linux distro books in the library and kind of working from that. Um, I have two arguably adorable children, three and 10, and uh, I have done pretty much everything there is to do in this field, front end, back end, ops, everything, except figure out how to get paid to do Haskell, but that's a secondary story. Um, all right. Intersourcing 101, for people that don't know, uh, it's replicating as much of the open source development model within the confines of a company as is possible. Now, employees can see each other's code, they can raise issues on each other's code, and they can fork and create merge requests against each other's code. This is sort of the core definition. Also, let's talk about oysters, oyster shucking. If you don't know what this is, this is prying open oysters in order to get at the edible meat inside. Uh, it's something that pros can do very quickly in under three seconds. Uh, oysters are stubborn, well armored, and they don't want to open up or change what they're doing. Kind of like big corporations. Pop quiz. Have you worked in a medium large corporation for any length of time? Are you alive? You've been frustrated by the inability of that organization to change, I bet. Okay? Just going to put that out there as a guess. Like all organizations, even the big sexy ones, T-Mobile has resistance to change. Some common objections you'll hear, and you've probably heard some of these wherever you work. This is a fundamental change that scares me. This is something that our group doesn't own that scares us. We've tried this before, it didn't work. Senior leadership X doesn't understand why it matters, blah, blah, blah. This won't work because of corner case, all these things. Uh, here's the kicker, though. You can't fight this resistance. You can't fix it. Neither can your management, and crucially, as a software engineer, you understand this, neither can you by getting into management, okay? So what, do we give up? We say we can't change the way corporations work at all, it's unfixable, it's too hard, it's too big of a problem? Should we give up? No, we shouldn't give up. Giving up is no fun. Giving up limits the good you can do, and we should get smarter. So you say, okay, but define smarter, at least within the context of an organization and working to change it. Okay, fine. Are you ready? Smarter equals oysters. Let's, let me explain. Step one, maxim one, you gotta wanna eat the oyster. Devs are often expected to be passionate about things that they aren't, so make sure that you pick something that you are actually passionate about, whether it's open source or whatever else. Uh, open source is important to me personally. It's how I got into computing. It's uh, what I consider to be a, uh, it, it's the way I think is the ideal way to develop software, both uh, in terms of the ethic and the, the, the behind it, as well as the process. T-Mobile had a nascent open source program that was started by some brave and forward-thinking people that kind of operate on the periphery of the company, but it was still immature and largely operated in its own bubble. And some of us engineers and some supportive management within the company heard this concept of inner source. We were like, ah, let's, 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 you know, this aligns with our goals of opening up the development culture with NT-Mobile. Let's see if we can bring some of this stuff in. This is important to us because it maps to what we know works, which is the open source model. Maxim two, right season, right tide. This is where GitLab comes into the picture. While our internal community of engineers was grappling with the problem of how to get T-Mobile to kind of adopt InterSource, we were also agitating for better tooling, starting with the Git platform. We wanted something modern, unified, and we wanted SaaS because we'd had bad experiences with on-prem versions and balkanization there. Uh, and the existing on-prem solutions we had were, you know, propped up a lot of corporate dysfunctions. They were segregated by group, balkanized, had defaults that encouraged the wrong behavior, lacked integrations with modern tooling. There were politics over who controlled what. It was just kind of gross, so we were like, hey, let's do SaaS. Let's just sweep all that under the rug. And luckily, as this was going on, actually, the, to the, the tools team came under new management and reached out to these engineers that were actually for change, and we had like, some allies. We were like, hey, we, we lucked out. We got allies. The tools team said, hey, we want to change this too. These engineers that were like, we need better stuff. We all got and talked. It was very happy and fun. Uh, we got buy-off on GitLab. It all worked out pretty well. Devs were loving it. Management was on board with it. It was great. I want to make a small point about political capital, though. Uh, th this term, this core engineer, group of core engineers that we're trying to push for change. Not everybody has political capital to spend. It's fine if you don't. Uh, if you do, though, and you know who you are, if you do, make sure you spend it on your company and your teammates and improving the process for the guy that's coming up next to you because it's way more beneficial than just spending it on yourself, which people tend to do by default. Maxim three, all you need is a pocket knife applied at the right spot. 
So here's where we brought in inner sourcing. The old pre-GitLab source control had been scoped by team and locked down by team. You couldn't see what team B was working on if you were on team A unless you went through a process to get permissions, to get added, to see what they were working on, all very you know, segregated. You couldn't see the code of a guy that sat next to you at all unless you like, went through, jumped through hoops. Everyone agreed that things like collaboration and transparency and cross-team uh, culture of excellence was important, but like our tooling defaults did not operate in that framework. And we knew that if we tried to launch an inner source uh, initiative on top of those defaults, it would fail because you could say, I want to do this thing, but if your tooling doesn't support that or doesn't assume that, it's just not going to work. So we had a thought. What if, as we were adopting GitLab, we made the default role that everybody in the company gets as they're dropped into our GitLab instance be reporter? If you're not familiar, reporter has read-only access to all repos. They can fork, they can submit a merge request, they can open issues, but they can't do anything else. So we said, hey, let's actually literally, with that one small little change, just make sure that everybody gets dropped into the T-Mobile's instance has that read-only role. Very tiny change technically, like a one-line change was required to make that flip that switch. But that changes the whole thing because that flips the default from default closed, opt-in open to default open, opt-in closed. And that could be like a huge cultural shift if we could get it to stick. All right. Max and four. Apply minor force and pop that sucker open. But don't hurt anybody with a knife. Be careful while you're doing it. Uh, we knew that a lot of devs would understand what we were doing and why it was important, but we also knew that there were groups that would ha we would have to convince and talk to, most notably our legal and, dig and uh, digital security groups, and kind of pitch this idea to them. So we started there because we knew those would be the biggest hurdles to get over. We knew there would have to be an opt-out pathway, whether it be a, via NDAs or marketing stealth mode. There's always going to be some projects that don't want that default inner source opt-in open. So we needed a, an escape valve. And we knew we needed to be very clear about the criteria you would need to opt out of this default open environment, right? It's, it, that very, it's very important that that very, was very specific, so people just, just say, well, I'm going to opt out, and then, you know, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, and then we realized as we dug deeper into this, there was no existing standard around uh, why this, um, <clears throat> around, around what would allow you to, opt, to, to, what would require your projects to be closed. Like, before this even came along, T-Mobile, there's like some projects were under, you know, restricted project mode, some weren't. And the process for actually you know, slicing that up and saying these are restricted, these aren't, was very ill understood already at T-Mobile. So we realized this was a weak point we could press on. Uh, we could actually go to people and say, hey, we need more clarity on what exactly qualifies a project to be closed. And I want to actually point out here, this is important. We did not go to digital security and legal saying we want permission to open up all the repos. We said, hey, we want more criteria on what justifies closing off a project. Very important phrasing, because it's flipping the assumptions of what you're talking about, right? You're not asking for permission. You're saying, we're going to do, as a development group, we have chosen to do this. We understand there's a need to opt out. Can you please help us with this criteria for opting out? And of course, there wasn't actually one. And we knew that if we did that, we would either get to write the criteria, or you know, it would scare somebody out of the woodwork to be like, well, actually, you can't do this because of X, Y, Z, and we could have a conversation there. So uh, we did that, and we went to them with that, that conversation. And we had some leadership backing. As I said before, we had allies. And that largely worked. So that, that, that largely uh, helped us actually shift the script a little bit and pitch it that way. Maxim five, turn it into a party. It's way more fun. Here's, something, here's the things that we found that tend to work when you're trying to build popular support in a large org. When I say popular support, I mean management and devs and everybody else. Uh, make your decisions out in the open, all of them, using an inner source repo as your documentation, uh, vision, source of truth, whatever, is ideal. Make sure you force decisions and discussions out in the open in merge requests rather than email or Slack or meetings. This is a real hard thing for T-Mobile to get their head around in most large companies, but it's something you have to actively, consciously force. Say, Let's move this to a merge request, or let's at least put a merge request at the end of all these processes so that all that is forced to happen out in the open. Never forget that a complaint is a disguised attempt to get involved and own a contribution. In my experience, that is always true. Recruit people that seem to be opponents whenever possible, okay? Someone that asks a question or, or it says, I don't understand this, or you can't do this because of X, like talk to them, work with them, and ask them to contribute to the FAQ, or ask them to like help you work through that, and then build some guidance out in the open using merge requests. That actually works. Like, uh, if somebody says this needs to be done, ask them to do it. It's not particularly difficult 
to roll people in. And usually, people are willing to do that. Uh, build a stealth community, or blue oyster cult, if you will, of, of like-minded engineers that uh, are, want these changes and want to improve the culture and are interested in pushing things forward and, and cultivate that. Cultivate it across remote offices. If you're a company that is not fully distributed and you still have offices in different parts of the country, like as you're trying to build this community of engineers, reach out to the ones in the remote offices because a lot of those guys tend to be, or guys or girls tend to be, feel as if they are isolated already and rolling them up into this community, this informal community is usually much easier because they're very willing and very able to help and become part of that. All right, so reiterate. Here's what we did. We reframed the workflow by changing a single default. We leveraged that to reframe the organizational ask into a request for clarification instead of a request for permission. And we did it collaborat collaboratively, out in the open, and we rolled people in as volunteers wherever we could possibly do it. So we did it very visibly, very obviously. We made all our decisions out in the open, and this built popular support within the company for it. All right, I want to leave you with one quote here from Charity Majors. If the senior ICs don't assert their leadership, managers are unlikely to give it to them. If managers try, but senior ICs do not inhabit their power, eventually the managers just shrug and go back to making all the decisions. This is ultimately why this is a change that must be driven and owned at a minimum co-owned by the senior individual contributors. That is 100% true wherever you work. Anywhere, where, whether it's a big company or whatever, you have to have that or it's not going to work. You cannot stop and say, well, management's going to cause this thing to happen. No. Your senior ICs with political capital need to be able to push it. <laughs>